Ladies and gentlemen, in 1964, as part of its founding mission to support education in the field of aeronautics and aerospace, the Wings Club created the annual site lecture to provide the opportunity for an outstanding contributor with long-term vision to discuss the advancement of aviation and aerospace. It is very fitting then that we welcome Jeff Bezos today for our 48th site lecture speaker. Jeff is the chief executive officer of Amazon, founder of Blue Origin. Jeff was also named the Time Magazine Person of the Year in 1999. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Bezos. For today's interview session, we are very pleased to have Jeff Faust with us today. Jeff is the Senior Aerospace Analyst with uh, Space News. Please join us on stage. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. All right. Good afternoon. Thanks for doing it. Oh. Thanks for doing this. This is great. I want to start off with sort of a big picture here. We're, we've got the luminaries of the aviation industry in here in this room. Um, the aviation industry is, is a mature, strong, safe industry, um, but it's grown that way over the course of more than a century. Yeah. Commercial space flight is still well on its way towards getting to that goal. Do you yeah, see? Yeah, we're still at the barnstorming phase. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's a great point to start. Where do you see sort of the, some parallels between the growth of aviation and the growth of commercial space, and what role is Blue Origin going to play in enabling that? I really do think we're at the barnstorming phase, and it's a very interesting analog uh, to early aviation because, in a lot of industries, new technologies are first used for entertainment. It's happened over and over again across industries. And of course, barnstorming was one of the first commercial things that small aircraft could do a long time ago. And you see that today, a very uh, prominent case today is in machine learning and in artificial intelligence. GPUs the, the, uh, are instrumental in doing machine learning, but they weren't invented for machine learning. They were invented to play video games. And you see this pattern happen over and over. Uh, and one of the things that I'm very excited about with New Shepard, which is our suborbital tourism vehicle, is using that to get a lot of practice. So one of the equilibriums that we're at today with Space Launch is that we don't get to practice enough. And so we need to be doing, we need to be going to space very frequently in a very routine way. One of the reasons that aviation is so safe today is because we do have so much practice. There are a bunch of reasons why it's safe, but that's one of them. What we want to do at Blue Origin is try to get on that practice curve. And to do that, you have to have an operable, reusable vehicle. You can't take your, you can't fly your 767 to its destination and then x-ray the whole thing, disassemble it all, and expect to have acceptable costs. And the vision is to figure out how there can really be dynamic entrepreneurialism in space. So I've witnessed this incredible thing happen on the internet over the last two decades. I started Amazon in my garage 24 years ago and drove all the packages to the post office myself. Today we have 600,000 plus people, millions and millions of customers, a very large company. And how did that happen in such a short period of time? It happened because we didn't have to do any of the heavy lifting. All of the heavy lifting infrastructure was already in place for Amazon. There was already a telecommunications network which became the backbone of the internet. There was already a payment system, it was called the credit card. There was already a transportation network called the US Postal Service and the Royal Mail and Deutsche Post all over the world that could deliver our packages. We didn't have to build any of that heavy infrastructure. And another, an even more uh, stark example is Facebook. Here's a, 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 a guy who literally, in his dorm room, started a company, Mark Zuckerberg, started a company in his dorm room, which now is worth half a trillion dollars less than two decades ago. So how do you get that kind of entrepreneurial dynamism in space? You need to lower the price of admission. Right now, to do anything interesting in space, because it requires so much heavy lifting and so much infrastructure development, you know, the entry price point for doing interesting things is hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Nobody's going to do that in their dorm room. You can't have the Mark Zuckerberg of space today. It's impossible. Two kids in their dorm room can't start anything important in space today. That's what Blue Origin's mission is. If we can do that, then the whole thing will take off and there'll be thousands of companies doing creative things in space. By the way, getting into orbit, it turns out there's not many creative ways to do that. Um, once you get into space, you can really unleash a lot of creativity. But the launch itself, uh, I have been through all of the creative ways, and believe me, chemical rockets are the best, and they are, um, they're actually not just the best, they're really good. You just can't throw them away after every flight. The propellants on New Glenn, New Glenn lifts off with almost 3.9 million pounds of thrust. It uses liquid natural gas and liquid oxygen as its propellants. The propellants to fuel New Glenn cost less than a million dollars. It is not the cost of fuel. It's taking all of that high-grade aerospace hardware and throwing it away. And you have to design for operability up front. And so that's one of the other reasons that we did New Shepard first, is we're taking all of the lessons that we have from New Shepard and incorporating them into New Glenn. And the reason we chose vertical landing as our recovery architecture is that vertical landing scales really well. In fact, the bigger the vehicle gets, the easier it is to land. And so uh, New Shepard is the hardest vehicle to land that we'll ever have to land. And so what does the future of, uh, of New Shepard look like? And when, once you actually start barnstorming and start carrying people, including presumably paying passengers? The strategic objective of New Shepard is to practice. And a lot of the subcomponents of New Shepard actually get directly reused on the second stage of New Glenn. And then the lessons learned on things like landing and operability and reusability, all those things from the New Shepard program, those also get incorporated into the New Glenn booster. All right. Do you think about uh, New Shepard and sort of the competitive landscape? There's, there's Sir Richard Branson's yeah. Virgin Galactic. Their Spaceship Two is going to be flying again in the next few days. Yeah. Do you think about how that's going to shake out in the marketplace? I think they have one of the issues that Virgin Galactic will have to address eventually is that they are not flying above the Kármán line. So, not yet. So mm -hmm. they, the vehicle isn't quite capable. So for most of the world, the edge of space is defined as 100 kilometers. In the US, it's different. But I think that one of the things they will have to figure out is how to get above the Kármán line. We fly to 106 kilometers. We've always had as our mission, we wanted to fly above the Kármán line because we didn't want there to be any asterisks next to your name about whether you're an astronaut or not. You know, you mentioned that uh, New Shepard is the stepping stone to, to orbital ambitions. You're working on the New Glenn launch vehicle, and sort of the building block of that is the BE-4 engine yes. that you're developing for that. How yeah. is the work on the BE-4 going? That's going uh, really well. We have tested that engine now that has 1,800 seconds of test time on it. It's been up to 400,000 pounds of thrust. It's liquefied natural gas as fuel, liquid oxygen as oxidizer, uses an um, oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle. It's a very advanced engine. We want it to be a 21st century American engine, kind of the, the new version of the F1. We're building a facility to manufacture those engines in Alabama right now, in Huntsville. We're also gonna build the upper stage variant of the BE3 there. And when that's up and running at full capacity, we'll be building dozens of engines a year there. Uh, we're building a big manufacturing facility, uh, which is already uh, largely complete, in Florida to build New Glenn. So I have what, video if you want. Should let's I roll show, that? Let's show the video, absolutely. The vehicle goes out to the pad in a horizontal configuration. Those are the, they have six landing gear. The vehicle has uh, strakes on the booster stage so that it has more L over D so that it can uh, more easily get back to the landing ship. The color of the flame is a little bit blue because of that liquefied natural gas is the fuel. The, the fins there you see at the forward uh, part of the uh, booster stage are for guiding the vehicle when it re-enters to take it back. There's the second stage firing with two BE-3 liquid hydrogen engines. Fairing separation. Here comes the booster stage to re-enter. There are seven BE-4 engines, 3.85 million pounds of thrust. It decelerates. It lands on an ocean-going ship. 
We've already acquired this ship. It's in the port of Pensacola now, and it's undergoing two years of renovations to turn it into a landing ship. The ship will be underway during landing so that we can use fin stabilizers. We want to be able to operate even in heavy sea states. Our requirement is that this vehicle should be able to fly any time they're flying airplanes out of the Orlando airport. And there's payload deployment. That's, our, that's already a lot on your plate, but you, you have a, a, a big vision of people, millions of people living and working yeah. in space. So there's got to be more steps beyond New Glenn. What's, what's down the road? If you look even further beyond that or ask the big question, you know, why do we need to go to space? Why do humans need to go to space? Mm -hmm. What is that all about? One thing that I find very unmotivating is the kind of plan B argument. So, you know, when Earth gets destroyed, mm -hmm. we want to be somewhere else. Um, <laughs> that I find very little, it doesn't work for me. Um, you know, we have sent robotic probes now to every planet in this solar system, and this is the best one. It's, <laughs> guys, it's not close. Um, my friends who want to move to Mars, I said, do me a favor, go live on the top of Mount Everest for a year first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and see if you like it, because it's a garden paradise compared to Mars. And so we do want to, we go to space to protect this planet, this, this planet. That's why the company is named Blue Origin. Um, it's the blue planet, it's where we're from. And, uh, but we also don't want to face a civilization of stasis. And that is the real issue if we just stay on this planet. That's the long-term issue. This planet is actually finite, but you can take something very fundamental, which is the amount of solar energy that this planet intercepts. This is a tiny little planet circling the sun, and the sun broadcasts energy everywhere. The sun is a nuclear fusion reactor, very conveniently provided for us, and it not only broadcasts, it only produces uh, fusion energy for us, it broadcasts it everywhere. Um, but we're only intercepting a tiny little bit of it. If you take current baseline energy usage globally and compound it at just a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, you have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. And even with uh, improvements in efficiency, it, it, it will be, um, it, you'll still have to ration energy use. And that to me doesn't sound like a very exciting civilization for our grandchildren's grandchildren to live in. This isn't for us, it doesn't matter for us, we'll, we'll be fine. But for them, that to me seems like a pretty bleak world. And we don't have to have that. The solar system can support a trillion humans. And then we'd have a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins. Think how incredible and dynamic that civilization would be. But if we're gonna have that, we do have to go out into the solar system. And we have to capture more of the sun's output. Uh, and we have to use all the resources that are out in space in terms of minerals and, and uh, uh, not just energy. And that's very doable, but we have to get started. The fact of the matter is we don't have forever. By the way, I think we'll live in giant O'Neill style space colonies. Gerard O'Neill, uh, you know, decades ago came up with this idea. He asked his physics students at Princeton a very simple question, but a very unusual one, which is, is a planetary surface the right place for humanity to expand in the solar system? And after doing a lot of work, they came back and decided the answer was no. But if you have uh, giant space colonies uh, uh, energetically close, and in terms of time, uh, travel time close to Earth, then people will be able to come and go. And very few people are going to want to leave this planet permanently. It's just too amazing. And ultimately what will happen is this planet will be zoned, you know, residential and light industry. Um, and we'll have universities here and so on, but we won't do heavy industry here. Why would we do, this is the gem of the solar system. Why would we do heavy industry here? It's nonsense. And so over time, of course we have to mm -hmm. today, but over time that transition will happen very naturally. It will even, it'll, it'll even be the business smart thing to do because it'll, energy and resources will be so much cheaper off planet that industries will naturally gravitate to those lower cost environments. How do you stay focused on that when they're all the day to day distractions and you have, I, I heard you have a, an e-commerce company called Amazon that you also run. Vision is 
absolutely important, but it doesn't deserve your day-to-day -day attention. So you need a vision, and it's a touchstone. It's something you can always come back to if you ever get confused. But mostly, your time should be spent on things that are happening you know, today, this year, maybe in the next two or three years. It doesn't make a lot of time to focus on things that are too far. You might have a few things that are five to seven years out. I would always encourage people to hold powerfully a vision and to be so stubborn on it. Don't let anybody move you off of the vision, but to put the vast majority of your energy and attention on things that are in a kind of two to three year time frame. And just let the vision be an emotional guide to that, a gut intuition guide to those more near-term activities. Well, our time is up, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing for the new questions. Shepherds and thank new you, everybody. Thank you very much.